to city life itself. As a general rule, successful urban open spaces are related to, in fact, part of, the bustle of a city's activities. The size of a city open space is far less important than how it functions where it is. New York's WPIX Plaza on the corner of 42nd Street and 2nd Avenue is an outstanding example of well-placed, well-designed urban open space, especially on a sunny day. Full credit should go to the owners and designers of the office building it adorns for creating and maintaining it. For contrast, let's look at another plaza only four blocks away. It's 20 times bigger than WPIX. It is kept clean, it's carefully policed, and needs to be, for almost nobody comes here because there's nothing to look at, nothing to do. None of the big city action that flows around you as you sit in WPIX Plaza. Every city neighborhood needs open spaces just so people can rest or stroll about and see a bit of green. When well placed, these are usually well used. Washington Square on a busy day reminds you that even open spaces could use some open spaces. One reason why Washington Square works so well as a city open space is because so many different kinds of people find so many different kinds of things to do here. Washington Square Park observes what I like to call the three rights of man. The right to sit down, the right to get a drink of water, and the right to use free public plumbing. Designers of city parks could learn a lot by watching the ways people use, or fail to use, the open spaces they've been provided with in the past. It's generally assumed that peace and green are what are wanted most. Some do want these things, but by no means all. By Green Park standards, this narrow strip of dirt and concrete along Houston Street near the Bowery should be a wasteland. Instead, it's one of the liveliest open spaces on Manhattan for at least eight months of the year. The Italians who brought us this game of bocce and are teaching it to the Puerto Ricans have had centuries of experience as urban dwellers. We could learn a great deal from them about how to enjoy open spaces in a city. Another group of local residents proved that summer and city living go together fine without benefit of penthouse, pool, or air conditioning when the city gives them tables in the sun. Nobody has yet designed a city open space quite so universally used and appreciated as the stoop. Why? Well, it's both public and private. It's yours, 
yet you aren't cut off from anyone who passes. You aren't missing anything. By just sitting there, you have a feeling that you belong to the neighborhood and it belongs to you. Sidewalk games flourish in the city, often in spite of the fact that there are playgrounds close at hand. It's not just that the kids are contrary. They're like the rest of us. They want to be in the middle of things. Most neighborhood fairs that once turned drab streets into worlds of gaudy life have been killed by traffic regulations. And our cities are duller, if somewhat quieter, for their loss. New York's San Gennaro Festival is a welcome exception. Well, nobody goes home hungry, at least. Most of the old street festivals are gone, as well as many of the streets themselves. They don't build stoops anymore. But this does not mean city people have lost the hankerings these things once satisfied. sit out front and watch the world go by. People will find the unlikeliest places to sit, even when the architects seem to have done their best to discourage them. Some buildings reject people. Others welcome us. Across Park Avenue is the Seagram Building, whose forecourt was planned to invite people to linger. In its contemporary way, this is just one great big old-fashioned stoop. In half a dozen years, the Seagram Plaza has become one of the most used, respected, and loved open spaces in New York. Time Life's row of fountains is another particularly favored new style city stoop. Since this area is private property, it must be guarded and maintained by the owners at their own expense, which is considerable. But forward-looking managements are beginning to recognize that a building with a well-used open space has come a long way toward being what is called a good address. To be successful, an open urban space has to be appreciated, like anything else, which means it must come as a reward. The open space should be preceded, possibly followed, by unopened space. That is, streets or walks which are relatively narrow and tight by comparison. So that the square or plaza or whatever it is, comes as a contrast, a reward, an anticipated or remembered goody. An open field in the middle of a prairie would hardly do the trick. No contrast. Perhaps most important of all is that the space should be felt to be enclosed, however contradictory that may sound. It must be part of the city, 
embraced by the city. One must feel that the city has paused and encircled this precious area, keeping it as part of itself. Nowhere is this better seen than in the lovely sculpture garden of the Museum of Modern Art. What could be more delightful than this oasis of beauty in the middle of the raucous city? The plaza in New York is an almost ideal urban open space, framed as it is on three sides by tall buildings, with an opening to the north on Central Park. In contrast, here's a housing development, like ones you've seen by the hundreds. There is plenty of space as such, mind you, but it is shapeless, unenclosed, unframed, and one feels unloved. It is not so much open space as leftover space. It's space that doesn't welcome you. Although it may not go quite so far as to reject you as does this lawn at the United Nations and in two languages. Let's go back to the plaza and notice another thing about a well-designed urban space. The plaza has a center of interest its fountain and great statue. Every urban place needs something to form a nucleus, a point to which all other points relate. These things help to give open space shape and organic unity. Washington Square has its arch as an identifying symbol. Such things help to create an image in your mind. Gradually, with use, the space itself gains personality for you. It becomes some place, not just any place. It becomes not just a park, but your park. Taking our rules one at a time, let's look at Rockefeller Center. First, it has a strong center of interest in the sunken skating rink, which doubles as a restaurant in the summer. Next, you are well aware of the main plaza before reaching it. You see it along the flowered promenade with its pleasant seats and intriguing storefronts. And finally, its shape is strongly defined by the buildings that frame it. This is truly designed open space, nothing left over about it. But you don't have to be a corporation to get yourself some open space. Behind this block of converted townhouses in Greenwich Village, neighbors have joined forces to throw their backyards together forming a pleasant garden far bigger than they could afford individually and with no real loss of privacy. From above, which is where most city gardens are viewed, even fences don't give you privacy. What you lose by tearing down fences is just fences. Here's another example, this one in Philadelphia. The people on this little street have turned it into a sort of mall which they can enjoy together. Every house is decorated with its own window box, while beyond, a vacant lot has been turned into a community garden. The children have done the work themselves. It's truly theirs, so they respect it. Perhaps the most pathetic effort on the part of city people to find open space is the phenomenon called the private terrace, which is rarely more than an oversized windowsill. Usually they succeed only in intensifying that feeling of isolation, which is the curse of city life in our day as in no other. 
How much more successful is this little garden? Hardly any bigger than a so-called terrace, but to which personal attention and creativity have been applied. Nothing mass-produced could ever have the warmth and charm of this garden. And the word privacy doesn't enter into it. This is something that gives pleasure to the neighbors as well as the owner. People in the city have a desperate need to feel part of their surroundings, to personalize them. Yet the old ways of doing this are fast disappearing. Nowadays, neighborhood identity must be found beyond these bleak facades. When an open space, be it square, park, plaza, market, or what have you, achieves a distinctive character, something that is completely its own, different from all others, the people who are drawn to it and use it learn to recognize its personality and grow fond of it. They come back again and again until they themselves become part of its atmosphere and personality. And it is this combination of places and living people which results in urban open spaces that are organic living parts of a city. Neither the spaces without the people nor the people without the spaces will do the trick. It's not a question of one or the other. It's a question of both or nothing. To sum up, an open space in the city must first relate to the denser areas around it by being seen from them. Secondly, it should have a sense of shape or enclosure by the buildings around it. Otherwise, it might as well be a meadow. And third, it must have a center of interest, both in terms of form, such as fountains or what have you, and in terms of human activity. After all, being human, it's human beings that interest us most. Mm -hmm.